I'm Abigail. And I'm Keith. And this is the Global Treasures Podcast. We'll cover different World Heritage Sites each episode. These sites have been identified as having outstanding universal value. Because they have cultural and or natural significance that is so exceptional that it transcends national boundaries and is of importance to present and future generations. There are 1,199 sites across the world, with more being added every year. We'll spend each episode exploring the legends, history, travel tips, and so much more. Welcome to Season 2, where we will explore the 45 sites that UNESCO added in 1979. In this episode, Keith and I will be introducing you to Bialo Wieja Forest. In the heart of Europe, nestled between Poland and Belarus, lies a vast expanse of ancient woodland known as the Bialo Wieja Forest. This natural woodland, located 43 miles north of Brest, Belarus, and 33 miles southeast of Bialystok, Poland, is a haven of biodiversity, beauty, and cultural significance. At the heart of this forest is the Polish village of Bialowieja, from which, obviously, the forest takes its name. The village, believed to be one of the earliest human settlements in the area, has a name which means White Tower in both Polish and Belarusian. Centuries ago, the Grand Duke of Lithuania, Władysław Igeyo constructed a white wooden hunting manor in Białowieja, establishing a tradition of noble influence in the forest. It's actually here that he made legendary hunting trips into the wilderness. Today, the forest stands as one of the last remaining parts of the immense primeval woodlands that once blanketed the European plain. Protected across the ages by the likes of czars and commoners alike, it's managed to retain its natural splendor, largely untouched by the hands of time. Recognizing its unparalleled ecological value, it was inscribed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in the year 1979. Subsequently, in 1992, its protection was extended to encompass Belovishkai Pusha Forest, its counterpart in Belarus. This designation was further expanded in 2014 resulting in a vast protected area spanning almost 142,000 hectares, accompanied by a buffer zone of nearly 167,000 hectares. And a hectare is equal to roughly two and a half acres. This extensive protected area is divided into transition, buffer, and then core zones, each playing a vital role in preserving the integrity of the forest ecosystem. Within its boundaries, the Bielowieja forest harbors a complex of lowland forests characteristic of the Central European mixed forests terrestrial ecoregion. Here, amidst the towering giant oaks, a rich tapestry of habitats exist, providing refuge to a wonderful array of species, many of which are rare or extinct elsewhere in Europe. At the heart of this ecological marvel thrives a diverse and abundant wildlife a testament to the forest's exceptional conservation significance. From the majestic European bison, affectionately known as the king of the forest, to a myriad of birds, mammals, amphibians, reptiles, and invertebrates that call this place home, the Bialowieja forest is filled with the vitality of life. The European bison, the symbol of the forest, roams freely across its vast expanse, their numbers a beacon of hope for conservationists worldwide. With nearly 900 individuals, comprising almost a quarter of the world population, and over 30% of the free-living animals, these magnificent creatures are a comeback story. Throughout the seasons, the forest undergoes a magical transformation, each one bringing its own wonders and delights. For example, in early spring, the air is alive with the symphony of birdsong and the chorus of frogs, as they herald the arrival of mating season. Among the notable inhabitants are the elusive Eurasian three-toed woodpecker, the striking white-backed woodpecker, and an array of owls that inhabit the forest. Protected as part of the Natura 2000 network, the forest stands as a beacon of hope for conservation efforts across Europe. Supported by various European funds, including the European Regional Development Fund, 
It serves as a model for sustainable stewardship of our planet's most precious ecosystems. Nestled on the Belarusian side of the Biloe Jeff Forest lies the Belovskaya Pusha National Park, a sprawling expanse of natural wonder spanning over 684 square miles. Again divided into distinct zones, the park's core comprises about 38% of it, safeguarding its most pristine and untouched regions. Another 26% around that is allocated to regular use, ensuring a balance between conservation and sustainable human activities, while the remaining 36% is designated for tourism and economic endeavors. At the heart of the park lies the Belovskapushka headquarters, a bustling hub of research, conservation efforts, and cultural exploration. Here, amidst the tranquil surroundings, visitors can explore the laboratory facilities, a zoo where you can actually encounter the majestic European bison and semi-wild conic horses, or marvel at the grace of Eurasian elk and the tenacity of wild boars, and even a New Year's museum where the spirit of dead Marosh, the East Slavic counterpart of Father Christmas, provides further culture to explore. Perhaps the true treasures of the forest lie hidden within its ancient oaks, each one bearing witness to centuries of history. Some of these oaks are famous enough to have names and histories of their own, such as the Great Mama Musi, with its awe-inspiring circumference of 270 inches and a towering height of 112 feet. Another, the Patriarch Oak, stands as a timeless guardian, its massive 6.6-foot diameter 102-foot height, and its age of over 550 years, it stands as one of the oldest in the park. These are just a few of the famous oaks that dot the landscape of the park. The King of Nazawano, the Emperor of the South, the Emperor of the North, Southern Cross, the Guardian of Zwerznik, the Barrel Oak, the Dominator Oak, the list goes on and on. Yet, not all tales are of life and vitality. Some oaks, like the King of the Nazanoal, and the Emperor of the South, have succumbed to the passages of time, their once majestic forms now slowly returning to the earth from which they sprang. And then there are the legends, like the Agio Oak, under whose branches King Wadislav Yegio is said to have sought solace before the Battle of Grunwald in 1410. In the realm of pop culture, the forest emerges as an icon, weaving its presence through various mediums. The forest is featured in many works of fiction and nonfiction. However, in an interesting instance where video games meet conservation efforts, the forest finds new life in an unexpected way. Minecraft, the sandbox game, became a canvas for conservationists, as the forest has been meticulously recreated by players and developers in a one-to-one -one ratio. This ambitious project, spearheaded by Greenpeace Poland, aims to raise awareness about environmental preservation and the urgent need to protect our natural heritage. Through this medium, awareness of the forest has surged worldwide to a whole new set of people. The importance of this forest is somewhat due to the fact that it's kind of amazing that it's still intact. It's come under attack many, many times throughout human history, and it's important to understand the history to see why that is, so we'll dive in a bit further now. The human history of the forest began to unfold in the 14th century. In this untamed wilderness, travel was limited to the winding rivers that cut through the dense foliage, with roads and bridges a distant dream on the horizon. So the only way into, and then out of, and even through the forest, was by boat. Limited hunting rights were granted to individuals by the nobility throughout the 14th century. As the 15th century dawned, the history of the forest took a new turn, as it fell under the ownership of Grand Duke Jagela, a powerful ruler whose domain stretched across almost the entirety of the forest. Built in the heart of the forest, a wooden manor was his place of refuge during the plague pandemic in 1426. By the 16th century, the forest had become a place of such importance that in 1538, the first recorded piece of legislation on the protection of the forest emerged. Under the rule of Sigismund I, poaching of the bison that roamed its sacred groves was met with the death penalty, a testament to the importance which the forest was held by the ruling class. It was during this time that Sigismund erected a new wooden hunting manor in the village of Biaul Liesia. From this complex, 
the forest took its name, for Bialowieja, meaning White Tower. The entire name, Bialowieja Forest, thus translates to, roughly, the Forest of the White Tower. The Tower of the Kamyanets on the Belarusian side, which was built of red brick, is for some reason also referred to as the White Tower, although it was never white. In 1541, the forest was declared a hunting reserve. A forest charter followed in 1557, establishing a special board tasked with overseeing the responsible usage of its resources, getting a closer look at how the forest was being used. The 17th century emerged as a pivotal era in the storied history of the forest, as kings and commoners alike left their mark upon its ancient landscape. In 1639, King Vladislav IV issued the landmark Bialowieja Royal Forest Decree. The king granted freedom to all the serfs dwelling within the forest boundaries in exchange for their service as Osnesi, or royal foresters. These newly liberated individuals were tasked with the duty of caring for the forest in exchange for freedom from taxation. Under this decree, the forest was divided into 12 triangular areas, each overseen by a central hub in Bialowieja. Under the reign of King John Kashmir II, the forest was mostly unpopulated by humans. Yet, in the late 17th century, the forest witnessed change as several small villages emerged on its outskirts. Driven by the promise of riches from the development of the iron ore deposits and the tar within the forest, settlers from Masovia and Polaski arrived to the region to establish villages, many of which still exist today. After the partitions of Poland, Tsar Paul I, seeking to assert his dominion over the land, stripped the foresters of their granted freedom, relegating them to the status of serfs under the rule of various Russian aristocrats and generals. In addition, a large wave of hunters were allowed into the forest, their sights set on the bison that roamed. In the span of a mere 15 years, the population of these creatures plummeted from over 500 to fewer than 200 their fate hanging in the balance as a species that could survive this onslaught. A glimmer of hope emerged with the dawn of the 19th century as Tsar Alexander I, recognizing this plight of the bison, reintroduced the concept of the reserve, hiring a small group of foresters to safeguard the animals from the ravages of hunting. By the 1830s, the bison population recovered to about 700 individuals. The protection of these animals broke down again, though, with the outbreak of the November Uprising of 1830 to 1831, where the majority of the foresters laid down their tools to join the fight, leaving the bison vulnerable to exploitation once more. In 1860, Tsar Alexander II visited the forest. Moved by the plight of the bison, much like the Tsar before him, he issued a decree to re-establish their protection, ushering in a new era of conservation. Under his orders, locals killed all predators, including wolves, bears, and lynx. From 1888 to 1917, the Russian czars owned all of the primeval forest, which became a hunting preserve. In what was later to become an important event, these czars sent live bison as gifts to various European capitals. The czars were also responsible for populating the forest with deer, elk, and other animals imported from around the empire. As the 20th century unfolded, the Bialowieja forest found itself ensnared in the tumultuous grip of war, occupation, and political upheaval, its ancient woodlands suffering from the tools of greed of the modern age. In 1912, the forest welcomed its last Russian royal visitor, Tsar Nicholas II a fleeting moment of tranquility before the storm of World War I had ascended. As this conflict raged on, the forest suffered heavy losses. In August of 1915, the German army seized control of the area, turning the forest into a battleground of industry and destruction. Miles of railway tracks were laid, three lumber mills were built, and bison, deer, and wild boar fell beneath the guns of hunters and poachers, their numbers quickly dwindling. On September 25th of 1915, an order was issued forbidden hunting on the reserve, but German soldiers, poachers, and Soviet marauders 
continued the slaughter until February 1919, when the area was captured by the Polish army. By this time, there were no more bison remaining in the forest. In the aftermath of war, as the borders of new, old, and returning countries were being drawn, the forest faced a new age. In 1921, the core of the forest was declared a national reserve. While this was a positive development, it didn't mean the forest was necessarily safe from harm. This point was the lowest for European bison, as there were only 54 known individuals surviving in zoos around the world, none of them being in Poland. In 1929, a small herd of four were bought by the Polish state from some of these zoos and from the Western Caucasus, where bison were to become extinct just four years later. To protect them, most of the forest was declared a national park in 1932. The reintroduction of the bison was actually successful, and by 1939, there were 16 individuals in the park. In 1939, the local Polish inhabitants were deported to remote areas of the Soviet Union and replaced by Soviet forest workers. World War II brought fresh horrors to the forest as German forces occupied the area once again, transforming it into a hunting ground for Nazi officials and a refuge for partisans. Hermann Göring, a leader of the Nazi party and one of the architects of the Nazi police state in Germany, planned to create the largest hunting reserve in the world in the forest. After July of 1941, mass executions and anti-partisan operations left their mark upon the forest. The forest became a refuge for both Polish and Soviet partisans, and Nazi authorities organized mass executions and reprisal. A few graves of people killed by the Gestapo can still be seen throughout the forest. Hermann Göring directed these anti-partisan operations by the Luftwaffe in the forest between 1942 and 1944 that resulted in the murder of thousands of Jews and Polish civilians. By July of 1944, the area was overtaken by the Red Army. The withdrawing Wehrmacht troops demolished the historic Bialoieja hunting manor in their retreat. With the war's end came a new era of uncertainty. The forest found itself at the center of a geopolitical tug of war between Poland and the Soviet Union. At the helm of the Polish Committee of National Liberation was Edward Ohab, who wrote about the negotiations that unfolded over this forest's division. The Soviets repeated many times, Okna broke, that they were not interested in enlarging their estate, but only in sorting out the issue of the Belarusian and Ukrainian nationalities in that border area. He was actually referring to the area of the forest. Yet, Akab countered, insisting that these issues did not exist in this area. To Akab, the forest was not merely trees and animals. It held within it echoes of Polish resistance against tyranny. It was a sanctuary where guerrilla fighters had battled fiercely during the uprising against the Tsarist regime. So it should stand as a Polish national reminder on Polish soil. But Akab's pleas fell on deaf ears as Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union, pressed for a swift resolution. The forest, he insisted, must be divided to close this case. As the negotiations reached a fever pitch, Akab, weary and completely disheartened, sought solace in a moment of desperation. He retreated to a nearby room, where he confided in his associates, his resolve faltering as he contemplated the sacrifices demanded by the Soviet-Polish friendship. At this time, Akab contemplated resignation, but before he could act, fate intervened in the form of a phone call from Wachuslav Machtendov, the Soviet foreign minister. With bated breath, Akab listened as Molotov delivered the news. Stalin had relented, agreeing to transfer half of the forest to Poland, including the cherished village of Bieloujeja. A hollow victory, Akab wrote later, as the weight of compromise settled upon his shoulders as he was actually hoping for the entire forest to come under Polish jurisdiction. The Soviet part of the park was put under public administration, while Poland reopened the national park in 1947. In December of 1991, the decision to dissolve the Soviet Union was spelled out by the Belevza Accords, and this was signed at a meeting in the Belarusian part of the Forest Reserve by the leaders of Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus. 
the Soviet side of the forest immediately came under the jurisdiction of Belarus. As the 20th century drew to a close, the Bieloujeja forest stood as a testament to the resilience of nature and the enduring spirit of those who fought to protect it. Amidst the echoes of conflict and the whispers of the past, its ancient woodlands remained a sanctuary of life amidst the ever-changing tide of history. So with a forest that is so steeped in history and so full of beauty, you can imagine that this must be a place that is firmly on many must-see lists. As always, Abigail is going to share some tips to get to this forest so you can actually experience it firsthand. So, if you want to travel to Bieloujeja Forest from outside of Poland, you'll want to fly into Warsaw Chopin Airport. Upon arrival, you'll have to take a train, bus, or rent a car to get to the forest, because it's over three hours away. Again, depending on what else you're doing during your trip, a car may be the best way to get around. Once you get to the park, it's free to enter the Educational Pavilion and Palace Park. You do need tickets for the Bison Reserve, National and Forest Museum, and Protected Area of the Forest. And you can buy tickets ahead of time on the website or day of on-site. In order to access the protected area, you have to use a licensed guide. I saw on the National Park website that they have a list of licensed guides. However, you do have to book that part yourself in advance. You can also book a bison safari tour or a bird watching tour on vetted sites as well. This will ensure that you get a tour guide in your native language. Remember, the language spoken primarily is Polish. This trip will likely include lots of hiking, walking, and cycling, so wear your sneakers. Expect to spend many hours exploring the area. You may want to dedicate an entire day, especially if you're into photography. And just one tip I know I plug in a lot of episodes, but it really is important. Please don't feed the animals to try to get photos or just because you think you're being nice. You're not doing them a favor. Actually, we have that problem in the United States as well, especially in Yellowstone. So, if you do get a rental car, do you have any suggestions on other things to see, like, in that area? One place you might want to visit in the area, if it's open, is the St. Nicholas Orthodox Church in Bieloujeja which is also where most people lodge. It's known for its beautiful iconostasis made from Chinese porcelain. And if you're wondering what iconostasis is, basically think of a wall of gorgeous and ornate paintings and artwork. So I know this is a must-see destination for conservationists, outdoor adventurers, and animal lovers. I can imagine that many people visit the forest each year. Do you find out how many? Yeah, up to 150,000 tourists visit the Polish part of the forest each year, with only about 10,000 or so of them being non-Polish residents. Well, I think it's probably obvious that there's no restaurants in the forest, but I saw that there were a few restaurants in nearby towns in Poland, close to the entrance to the park. I'm guessing that they serve all the Polish staples, but I imagine there also must be some local specialties that use ingredients that are unique to the forest and maybe even the region. You're right, no drive through McDonald's in this forest. On site, just expect a vending machine in the educational pavilion. You'll probably want to bring a picnic lunch or pack snacks in water. So this area has a very interesting mix of Belarusian and Polish specialties. So you can get items like pierogies, sausages, and draniki, which are a thicker potato pancake. Apparently, they love their potatoes in Belarus, and I'm on board with that. Venison prepared with vintage recipes and marchionek cakes and teas made with local honey and herbs are also standouts. Holy smokes, I keep hearing about the great food of Poland, and it's just strengthening my need to get there. So, Abigail, I know you like to research the paranormal, the conspiracy theories and legends surrounding these sites, so I'm assuming you found out a bunch about the forest. There must be a ton of stories, seeing as it's like a dark and dangerous forest. No surprise, given the sordid history and its role, serving as a safe haven and hiding spot for many during World War II, many claim that the forest is haunted. When parts of eastern Poland fell into the hands of the Nazis, led by Adolf Hitler, ghettos were established in the area. Much like other parts of the world, Jewish residents were forced into one small area within larger cities, often living in cramped, unsanitary conditions. Thousands were killed, sometimes in a single day. 
Some residents who were able to escape fled into the forest, though ultimately succumbed to the elements. To this day, people claim to hear cries and voices in the night, though there's no one around. Another legend surrounding the forest involves the White Lady. Numerous countries and places around the world report similar legends around a ghostly woman donning a white dress, showing herself to travelers in the center of the forest, filling visitors with trepidation and terror. People also report seeing strange lights twinkling among the trees, lighting up the forest with a supernatural glow. And while it's beautiful, this forest is sort of creepy. I wouldn't want to be there alone. Holy smokes, this sounds like the beginning of a horror movie. Well, with an old growth forest in the middle of Europe with all that history, I can actually understand why legends and hauntings are part of the tapestry of the forest. I'm also not sure I'd want to camp there alone. All right, so it sounds like this forest is well-preserved now. Am I getting the right impression? So, in terms of preservation for this site, Bielo Biesia National Park, the Polish Forestry Administration, and the Bolaviska Puszka National Park Authorities have an agreed-upon management plan for the foreseeable future. Bielo Biesia National Park is in the Natura 2000 network, as Keith mentioned before, which was established to protect Europe's most valuable species and their natural territories. The park also receives funding from the European Regional Development Fund, which allows them to monitor bison online through webcams, which is pretty cool. Other endeavors to keep the park safe includes keeping tabs on fire management, which typically involves measures like creating safety plans, and educating the public on how to prevent forest fires. More recently, logging was a risk to the ecosystem. So the forest is protected by a conservation law in the EU called Habitats Directive. Over 120,000 people in Poland signed a petition asking the government to stop the practice. Poland did pause it in April 2018 when it was ruled that they had broken laws. So they had to stop logging or risk a minimum fine of millions of euros. It was a little confusing in my research, but it looks like they may have started up again after all that hubbub. What I do know for certain is that as of early in 2024, the Polish government required logging to be stopped in the forest. It's estimated that 160,000 to 180,000 trees were cut down. Thankfully, it seems the pause will be permanent this time. One last thing I thought was interesting. In 2022, UNESCO asked Poland to pause construction of a border wall with Belarus that would run through the forest until they can prove with evidence that the wild and plant life would not be negatively affected. Wow. We actually keep hearing about these amazing sites in and around Poland. Poland is quickly becoming a planned destination on my travels so that it can go see all the sites we've mentioned so far in Season 1 and now in Season 2. I simply can't wait to go. Thank you for listening to the Global Treasures Podcast. If you would like to support the show, you can subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also check us out on YouTube and TikTok. Join us in two weeks as we continue our adventure into the 45 sites that were added in 1979. We're both excited to explore Boyanan Church in Bulgaria. We'll see you there.